everyone here is Paul. He will kick ass and chew bubblegum. Thank you, Nick. So a couple of months ago, after this meetup, I sat down with Nick and said, so in May, I'd like to give a talk. But I can't tell you what it's about yet. He's like, okay. So I sent him this abstract with that title, From Big Table to Eighth Base and Back Again, History and Future. And if you search for that, you'll see, uh, you, get some, you get some results here. The first few results are all about Stratacomp, 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 and then Seattle Scalability pops up. Well, what this was about was on, um, uh, let's see, what was this, May 5th? Yeah, May 5th. Uh, we stood up at Strata, and uh, we announced that we were making Bigtable, Google Bigtable, you've heard of it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Google Bigtable available um, as part of the Google Cloud Platform. So that's why the abstract on this talk didn't really talk about Google Cloud Bigtable, but that's actually what I'm here to talk about today. So, so we announced this. Um, I'm going to assume since I'm at you know, Seattle Scalability, and this is a little intimidating, I will say, because I'm quite confident there are people in this audience who know more about NoSQL than I do, and I'm going to stand up here and talk about a NoSQL database for 30 minutes. So, you know, no pressure there. But we announced that we were making Google's version of Bigtable uh, available uh, as part of our cloud platform. So what does this look like? This means uh, it's a fully managed service. You basically click a few buttons and suddenly you have a big table cluster of your own to use. Um, but you access it using the HBase API, which some of you may be familiar with. So I'm going to be talking a bit about this. Um, I will say that many of these slides were taken from Corey's talk, and Corey is a uh, product manager, so I apologize in advance if they seem a little bit sales pitchy now and again, but I'm going to try and stick to the technical stuff, because once again, this is Seattle Scalability and you're here for the technical stuff. So Google's uh, mission statement, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. I usually feel kind of silly putting this slide up, but when I'm talking about big table, it actually seems kind of relevant because you do need a really big database to store all the world's information. Um, so, you know, a couple of great engineers at Google, Jeff and Sandre, uh, created this with the help of a bunch of other people. Um, this was our, this was Google's answer for how do you create a scale out system uh, which will handle sort of random access to huge quantities of data. How many people here have read this paper on Bigtable? All right, that's great. I reread it just this week preparing for this talk to make sure I remembered what was in it. It's a great paper. I totally recommend going back and rereading it if you've read it already. Um, and if you've never read it, it it's definitely worth your time. Um, so, but it's part of sort of this, uh, this continuum of stuff that we've been working on at Google. Uh, it builds directly on the Google file system, or uh, now on Colossus, which is the successor to the Google file system. And it works hand in hand with MapReduce. So that's sort of the, those three papers there, GFS, MapReduce, and Bigtable, sort of uh, really kick-started sort of the big data and NoSQL uh, revolution um, back in the last decade. Uh, and it inspired some of these things on the left. I'm going to talk a fair bit about HBase today. Um, but it also inspired Cassandra, Hypertable, and Accumulo. Apparently, um, you know, these, these databases are... Uh, are very clear about the fact that they were inspired by this big table paper. Um, and big table at Google underlies just about everything we do. Like you can see a bunch of product things over there that, um, that, uh, that are built directly on big table. But um, it's, not, uh, it's not an unfair statement to say a majority of the bytes that are stored at Google go through a big table layer at some point in the stack. Um, there are databases that are built on top of Bigtable. If you go read about Megastore, for example, you'll find that's a database layer on top of Bigtable, which adds uh, some interesting <coughs> functionality. Um, so you have databases on top of databases on top of databases, but at some point in the stack, most of the bytes at Google flow through Bigtable at some point. So what does Bigtable look like? Well, this is the, uh, this is the architecture of Bigtable. Um, 
essentially what you have is, uh, oh, wait a second. I think the point I wanted to make was, ah, yes, this is the point I want to make. So when we say HBase was inspired by Bigtable, as you can see, here's the HBase architecture. Here's the Bigtable architecture. Basically, cut and paste different names into the same diagram, and you have the HBase architecture. So it was a very faithful reproduction of the architecture uh, presented in the paper. This is one of the reasons why we've chosen to use the HBase API uh, to, uh, to provide access through the Google Cloud Platform to, to Bigtable, because there is a very nice clear mapping between the two. Um, all right, how big is big? We have Bigtable clusters at Google which store hundreds of petabytes of data in a single cluster, which serve tens of millions of queries per second, which the rest of the industry calls operations, uh, and hundreds of gigabytes of throughput per <coughs> second. So that's pretty big. Anyone here knows of a database bigger than that, I'd love to hear about it. And we'd love to, <laughs> Nick's raising his hand. But is it random access? Sort of, yes. <laughs> okay, we can debate that later. I mean, it's on tape. <laughs> <laughs> so what does, what does Bigtable look like? Well, it does not look like a relational database. You know, it's, it's NoSQL. Um, so you're not going to have tables that you join. Um, and the lookups are very structured. You know, this is a this is a direct quote from the from the paper. It is a sparse, distributed, persistent, multi-dimensional sorted map. That is the best one-line description to Big Table I've seen. And um, but what's interesting is the notion of atomic single row transactions. That seems weird. It's like why would you need a transaction on a single row until you realize this is a multi-dimensional map. So you can change multiple columns in the same transaction in an atomic and strongly consistent way on Big Table. <coughs> Not all NoSQL databases give you this, I can read my writes consistency within a row. So that is an important point, the atomic single row transactions. You don't get the relational style of transactions where you can modify lots and lots of rows and have that transaction be atomic. Between rows is not atomic, but within a row you can do atomic transactions. This is kind of a, uh, again, straight out of the paper, this is sort of what it looks like. And you can see it's sort of a two-dimensional grid with rows and columns, but then there's this third dimension of timestamps, because every time you write a new, uh, a new thing as a column within a row, it adds on with a new timestamp. And then you can configure rules which will allow you to say, oh, I don't want more than three old things or things that are older than two weeks I don't care about anymore, and Bigtable will go clean those up for you later. OK. So where am I going with this? Why did I put this here? OK. Right. So we've now talked about how um, we've now talked about how, the, how, how Bigtable's data model works. So coming back to the architecture, the way you get this to scale out is each row is in exactly one tablet. So a tablet is a collection of rows. You basically partition your key space uh, uh, up into multiple tablets, then you assign those tablets to tablet servers, and then you have many, many tablet servers. And this is how you can get databases that are hundreds of petabytes in size, serving tens of millions of transactions per second. Um, so what, is, what does this let you do? Well, you can do sort of in the top row here, you have your point operations. You can put a row, increment a row, append a row, or you can get or do short scans within, within a key space. Um, sort of in a more batch-oriented, high-throughput way, you can, uh, you can configure replication between big tables. So you can have a primary big table A, and then you can configure replication to another big table B, where all of the mutations you make to Bigtable A find their way into Bigtable B. This can be useful for high availability scenarios. This can also be useful for low latency scenarios where you are replicating uh, long geographic distances to put the data close to your customers. Yeah, question. This may be a stupid question, but how large is your row? You're saying we're, we're, we're working on a row by row basis, so I mean, if, it's, if the row is a petabyte long, that's not the 
Right, so you're not gonna have petabyte sized rows, but they're not measured in kilobytes either. Like, you can have uh, reasonably large rows. Like, you can store things like entire web pages in a column within a row, for example, or imagery within a column in a row. I don't have a precise answer to the question. I don't know what the maximum value is, but I can definitely find out. Yeah? Is replication asynchronous like it is in HBase? Replication is asynchronous like it is in HBase, yes. Uh, and then, of course, you can do bulk import to get lots of data into your big table quickly. Um, and, and this is kind of important, you can do full scans. If you want to run a MapReduce across the entire content, contents of your big table, you can do that. It's built for that. So you get the combination of low latency for these point operations and high throughput for these large bar bulk operations. So we like to think about big table in terms of three generations. Generation one is essentially what you can read about in the paper, the 2006 paper. It's like, we built this thing. This thing was really useful. Here's what it looked like. Um, and, you know, it has some useful, uh, useful properties, like any one tablet server can fail, and it will, it will recover from that. Um, and we learned a lot moving out the first applications onto Bigtable. But that led us to the second generation, which was all about how do we operationalize this thing? How do we make this super easy for everyone at Google to use? Um, and one big thing was if you want to use it as part of your serving path, you know, speed matters. And speed matters all the time. So we went on a really, really um, hard journey to bring the 99th percentile latency of requests to Bigtable, and frankly throughout our storage stack, down. That's a really hard problem. Like, getting most of your requests to go fast, or half of your requests to go fast, isn't too easy, because that's the happy path, right? It's when you get up to the 99th percentile of your requests, you're talking about how fast are we going to serve something when things are going wrong? That's what it takes to get your 99th percentile down. Um, so that's a hard problem. And then the other thing we did was we made Bigtable a service internally at Google, meaning if you are a product group at Google and you want to use the Bigtable technology, you're not grabbing a library, linking it into your stuff, you know, getting raw storage, getting raw compute, and setting up your own Bigtable cluster. You're just asking for some Bigtable resources from a Bigtable service that's available universally within Google. That's a big deal, because now you have multiple tenants in a service. And as everyone who's using the cloud knows, multi-tenancy is a pretty hard problem. Uh, so we've been working on that for a long time internally at Google. Some other neat things that we learned that have found their way into our internal version of Bigtable. Um, you can change the size and shape of a cluster to get different performance characteristics. You know, it's not, that's not all that surprising, but operationalizing that um, and finding the sweet spots and then finding, you know, the applications and mapping it to, to those things, you know, we, we gain a lot of that, in, uh, that knowledge internally. A big deal is what happens when a tablet server fails. So you have this tablet server which is serving a range of tablets and the machine dies for whatever reason. Those, those rows are now not available. <coughs> How quickly can you bring up a new tablet server serving those rows? This comes back to that whole 99th percentile latency thing. We can get a new tablet server up and running in a second. I think in HBase, they talk about a minute for about that same, uh, for that same scenario. And then of course replication uh, is a super useful feature that we've been using for a long time internally at Google. So now we think of the third generation as making this all available to everyone outside of Google as well. So we're offering it as a fully managed service, hopefully providing you like, with the benefit of the knowledge of us operationalizing this internally at Google. Uh, we're offering the, it through the industry standard HBase API, so hopefully you have tools and libraries and people who understand how to program this already. Uh, and we're using a fairly simple pricing model so that you can kind of understand what you're going to get for what you're paying. Um, and you get to pay for sort of serving resources independently of storage, which is useful because not all data sets are as hot. So you might have a very large data set that you're not serving that many queries on. Why get a cluster with huge serving resources? What you want is lots of storage and a little bit of serving resources. Vice versa, you might have a relatively small data set, which is extremely hot. 
This way you pay for what you need. And you get to, you get to turn that dial yourself. Um, and you know, the promise here is you can get high throughput and low latency and low cost and little to no configuration. And what? And partition tolerance. And partition tolerance. All three. No, it will not serve drinks. Um, so, uh, I've said this several times already. You know, we're using the HBase API. We love HBase. We love the community. We work very closely with them. If you go back and look at the commits running up to HBase one, you're going to notice a lot of Googlers were submitting stuff into the HBase code base running up to this. Um, you know, there's a good reason for that. This is what it looks like to create uh, to create a big table uh, on our cloud service. You can see up there it says, you know, you can choose the number of nodes. That's basically where you are choosing how many serving, uh, you know, how much serving resources do you want to dedicate to serving this data set. And then the cost for storage is you pay for what you use. So. Um, Who's used HBase? Anyone here? All right. So, you're ahead of me. I've never actually used HBase. So this is all rumor and innuendo. You haven't missed anything. <laughs> um, oh, sir! I'm, I'm told that compactions can be a problem with HBase. That they can, they're a little like Java garbage collection, for example, where things slow down while compaction is happening. Um, Place splitting is something that you have to think about if you know a, ta uh, a certain tablet is going to get really hot, you might want to pre-split it so you're, it's not doing that while you're trying to serve it. Um, I'm told there are lots of configuration settings you might need to tweak to get good performance. And I'm told that it can take up to a minute uh, to, uh, to bring a region server back online. So these are things that you're not going to see in Cloud Bigtable. Now there is one thing HBase has today that Cloud Bigtable does not have, and that is coprocessors. This is where you get to um, uh, have code run sort of out on the tablet servers. This is something that we have a version of internally at Google. Um, they talked about it in the big table paper, so this is not a secret thing. We just haven't figured out how, how are we going to map this into the cloud big table service. So what's the throughput look like? So this is the slide where people really start to pick at me, I think. So this is the uh, Yahoo cloud serving benchmark. What we did was we set up um, HBase, Cassandra, and Cloud Big Table in equal cost configurations. So the HBase and Cassandra clusters were roughly 10 VMs in size, um, and the Cloud Big Table was configured to cost the same as those VMs. So we're doing an equal cost comparison. Uh, and we ran a mix, like 50 50 read write bandwidth or read write workload. That's the graph on the left. So Cloud Big Table was up above 75 um, megabits per second, megabytes per second, um, and on the on the right we have a pure write uh, uh, benchmark. So there we were able to get over 150 megabytes per second. Obviously our line is above the other two lines, so we're pretty proud of that, and it's significantly above the other two lines. So you know this this is sort of the evidence of all the stuff I've been talking about where um, we've been using this for massive, massive workloads for a really long time within Google. And this is the result of that. Yes? Yes. You said you did comparable performance. Yes. You said Cassandra and HBase were 10 VMs. Yes. How, how many VMs was the, uh, the big thing? There's no, so the question is, um, we did, we did equal cost comparisons, and there was roughly 10 VMs for HBase and Cassandra. How many VMs was Cloud Big Table? You don't assign a VM to a Big Table. You assign a quote node, which is not quite a one-to-one -one mapping. I think we ended up somewhere in the eight um, range, but it's not really a one-to-one -one mapping between a Big Table node and a virtual machine. But it's close enough. Okay. Yeah, it's close enough. It's not like we were throwing a ridiculous quantity of resor big table resources to get this result and just discounting the cost. It's a, it's a reasonable comparison. Um, we are intending to publish a white paper on these tests that we ran so that you can like find all the details of exactly what was done. You know, because things like 
What was the HBase configuration? What was the Cassandra configuration? Uh, if you're familiar with PerfKit, which is an open source uh, toolkit that we are publishing for benchmarking cloud platforms, this is going to show up in PerfKit. So you'll be able to run this yourself if you want to, hopefully in the fairly near, near future. And so, read the source code. And read the source code. Which is even more important. Which is even more important. That's correct. So you can verify these claims yourself. Just real quickly, the, the, when you say node, yeah. is that, is that uh, a physical box somewhere and you have a virtual machine on it and there's attached storage, et cetera, et cetera. So because you said a second ago, you know, when one of these boxes when the machine goes down, how long does it take to bring it back up? Because I assume that the detached storage close to where the, the regions or the tables are being served, is that still true? So, so the question is, is a, is a quote, big table node actually a physical box somewhere? Um, and the only honest answer I can give you to that is I don't know. Well, I mean, more, more specifically, is the, is, the, is the storage of the data physically attached also on these boxes, and that is local to the VM that is serving? Right. I had a similar question. Is, is that including loading the data into the machine on the node itself? Or is the data, you said we're able to bring a node up or a, uh, a new instance up in a minute or less than a second. And you know, loading the data into that node, that, that, that seems a little bit unrealistic. So, so let's, um, a lot of the things I talked about earlier in the presentation were talking about Google's internal big table. Okay. That section of the presentation was sort of like, what have we been working on since we published the paper in 2006? Then I transitioned into, well, you can use this too, and now we have this concept of a node. Is a node a one-to-one -one correspondence with a tablet server? Is kind of the kind of the question. And the truth is, I don't know. That's something I really hope to learn soon, because I'm sure you're not the last people are going to ask me that. What I what I can say with reasonable confidence is that in all of our cloud services, we try and separate compute and storage as much as we can. You see this with, like, for example, if you're running Hadoop jobs on our platform, you can uh, read and write from Google Cloud Storage, right? So you're basically using your Hadoop cluster for the computation it provides, and your storage is going into this other storage medium. So you can scale up your storage independently of scaling up your compute resource. This is kind of like that, in that as you add nodes, you are not adding storage to your cluster. Well, I, I think sort of what this is leaning towards is, do you have data locality, physical data, data locality? And, and from your, your statement about there being a one second spin up, I had the same thought that he did, which was, oh, the only way that's possible is you don't have data locality. You know, you've lost a machine, a node, which is the region server or the table server or whatever, and that's okay. It only takes you a second to spin, spin up the service because the data is actually located. Right. So, so if you read, you know, the, the big table paper and the GFS paper, um, you'll see that, that that's absolutely what's going on, right? GF, the, the GFS, or now Colossus, is the storage medium for all of big table. And so when you lose a tablet server, you didn't lose the thing that had the data, that's in GFS, and there are multiple copies, or Coloss Colossus, and it's, you know, encoded differently. Um, so yeah, that's why you can bring up a new tablet server quickly, because it just comes up and then starts reading the data quickly from servers that are already up. So does the replication happen at the uh, GFS level between the different data centers, or how does replication come into play here? So all of, the, all of the distributed file systems that we've published information about are cell level. So what people would, uh, in the cloud world, we would call that a zone. Um, and uh, within those, Within those zones, that's where the replication happens. And there's different encodings. Like GFS was, you know, choose, choose your number of copies. Since GFS, we have moved to more efficient encodings that are not just plain replications. Um, so the replication happens within a zone, if that, if that answers your question. It's not multi-data center replication for this particular type of storage. Yep, question in the corner. Can you talk a little about what Cloud Big Table is doing that HBase and Cassandra are not doing? That you choose the standard for the latency. Thank you, I'll put you later. He asked, what are we doing that achieves this kind of latency that HBase and Cassandra are not doing? Um, so, you know, once again, impressive graph. Um, we're very proud of the fact that our 99th percentile latency in this test was down in the 6 millisecond range. You can see HBase is just as fast as us, latency-wise at serving the first 50% of the requests that come in. 
right? That's, that's when everything's going well. But we're pretty proud of the fact that even when things aren't going well, way out of the 99th percentile, we're still serving it quickly. Um, and that's when the other databases slow down. Yes, Nick? How big was N? How big was N? N? Like a hundred, thousand, million. I do not know the answer to that question. The question was how big is N? Like how many requests did we submit? It was the Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark. It was on a terabyte of data. I don't know what that came out to. Can you talk about how you brought the P99 to? Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the the question is, I think the question was how like is that client where are we measuring the latency? So this is within a data center client to server latency. Wow. Yes. Thank you. So I have a question on the on the availability. So you say you can spin up one new uh, couple server in a second, but that means all the data is cold, right? Because the data is somewhere else. You have, a, you have a new instance that needs more data, or so you need more gigabytes of data, cold data, so your latency must be through the roof at that point. Um, so the, the question is, I think, when you bring up a new tablet server, all the data is cold, so your latency must go through the roof. Um, you know what? Let me go through the next few slides. Let me hold that question and go through the next few slides. There may be some answers in there for you. There may not. If there's no answers in the next few slides, then there's a good chance I can't answer your question, so I'll find an answer. You know, give me your business card afterwards. So at HPXCon 2015, Carter Page gave, gave this great presentation, which I have you know, uh, basically stolen and put in here. And I'm going to now attempt to channel Carter. Wish me luck. Um, because I am not the engineering manager of Bigtable. So he clearly knows a lot more about this material than I do. But the slides are, the slides are really good, and hopefully, you know, the collective NoSQL wisdom in the room will understand them. So he shared these lessons learned. Um, they, they went to solve one problem, which I think may have been the how do we get tablet servers to come up quickly problem. Um, and then found that they got a whole lot of other benefits to it. And this was in the context of the HBase, or uh, yeah, the HBase Con keynote earlier this month, where he was sharing lessons learned from within Google, running Bigtable at scale with the HBase community as a whole, so that perhaps the HBase community could adopt some of these best practices that we found. So here's the uh, system architecture again. Just to review, a tablet server is responsible for serving a number of tablets, each of which has a range of rows assigned to it, a contiguous range of rows assigned to it. So if you have a hot tablet, um, the, 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 the way this works is uh, a write comes in, and you uh, write that to a shared log for that tablet server and you update an in-memory cache of that information. So that's, there's, your, there's your write. A write came in, you add it to the shared log. Um, the shared log gives you the durability, and the um, uh, adding it to the memory cache means you get to serve it quickly. If the server crashes, the, the new tablet server has to read through this shared log and get all the writes out of that shared log that are not reflected in the durable SS tables that are underlying those tablets. Um, after enough writes have come through, um, the writes in the memory table get flushed to an SS table. And at that point, you are, you know, the, the log is no longer relevant. So cold tablets, if you do this naively, you don't know it's cold when you're bringing up your new server. So you have to go through the whole shared log and say, oh, there was nothing in this shared log that was relevant to this tablet. Oh, well, that was a lot of waste of it, wasted effort. Um, so what, what, uh, what, they do, what we do is periodically we just advance the pointer for cold tablets. Even though no writes have come in, we just advance the pointer so we know we don't have to read all of that green stuff when we're um, restarting. So it turns out this happens a lot. So the majority of metadata operations on these tablet servers were these log pointer advances. So then the question was, why don't we just make these cold tablets read only? 
Well, that's crazy, right? Because you can write anywhere you want in any big table at any time. You can't make them read only, right? Well, you lose the ability to apply mutation, but you get all of you can still do all of these other things that big tables have to do, right? So they tried it. And so if a tablet hasn't received any mutations in a certain amount of time, they make sure there are no pending mutations, and they flip it to read only. Then, uh, let's see. Right, then they update the tablet metadata and remove the log pointer. So they're no longer advancing these log pointers all the time. When a write does come in on a quote read only tablet, now you have a problem. So what they do is they return a, an internal retry error to the client. So this would not be a, a, an error that would be seen by an application program. This would be something that would be handled in, in this case, the big table client that's embedded in the edge based client. Um, and while the client is you know, processing that retry, you do all of the bookkeeping you need to do to make this tablet read-write again. And then when the retry comes in, you're ready to handle it. So it turns out that adds, wait a second, somewhere in here, in one of these slides it says that adds two to four milliseconds of latency to that cold write to a read-only tablet. Um, so when you apply this technique, you go from having lots and lots of these log pointer advance operations to having almost none of them. And it turns out that saves a whole ton of CPU on your tablet servers. So, didn't see that coming necessarily. So, yeah, here we go. Here's the two to four milliseconds. So, you cut the metadata operations down, you reduce the load, um, there's no log sorting for crashed cold tablets, so this addresses the question I've gotten from a couple of people about how do you bring something up so quickly. Um, you're doing a lot less log processing when you're bringing up a new tablet server in this architecture. And the cost you pay is, like, on the first write that comes into a read-only tablet, you're paying two to four milliseconds of, of penalty. Yeah? Sorry, sorry can you uh, really quickly say why uh, they cut the metadata operations by 80%? Because we're not actually not doing the operations, we're just delaying them, right? So, you this green line here... You can collapse the advancements if you, if you, do, if you, if you defer them, because there's going to be multiple ones. So are you saying, oh, okay, that, okay. So are you saying this test was designed so that your 99th percentile stuff that is that, that, that H-based uh, contender were failing on was all CPU bound? I don't think I'm saying that. Well, okay, because you're gaining CPU on this. Right. But, no. but your 99th percentile... Yeah, so I, I don't know if I can repeat that question because I, I don't understand it. I'm just saying I'm just saying there are a lot of ways that machines fail. One of them right. is CPU, and these these machines are getting the CPU is getting hogged by this pointer advancement. So you get rid of that, all of a sudden your 99 percentile goes through the roof. But what if you're, what if you're not CPU bound? In other words, what if the problem that you have is bandwidth, or uh, because you got a whole bunch of data going across, or or, or it's memory, you can't get enough stuff in your cache because there's, there's all these requests coming in. Your hotspots are moving around, etc. So, so let me see if I can summarize. There are lots of reasons your latency can stink, and we could have gamed the system by choosing a CPU-bound configuration and then applying this optimization. So, um, when the source code is published, I encourage you to run the benchmarks and see what you get, because that's where the real proof will be. Nothing I can say will be better than that. This is all internal big table stuff. This has, this is not something that, this is, this is sort of a, you know, like I put this slide which shows we have great latency, right? And then the question is, well, how did you achieve that? Well, th this is stuff we've already done, right? This isn't stuff we did for Cloud Bigtable. This is stuff we did for all of the internal Bigtable people that are using it within Google because this saves, saving 7% CPU, like fleet-wide across the Google fleet, that's a lot of resources saved. Like, this is a really big deal for us, even if we never did Cloud Bigtable, right? We're providing better internal service for less money. Um, so, that's what this graph is about. Uh, okay, so here's a, uh, here's a graph showing that before we had read-only tablets on this particular cluster, which um, Carter represents as, quote, particularly gnarly, um, we were looking at a steady state of 99.9% .9 tablet availability, which means, you know, 0.1% tablet unavailability. 
Um, by flipping to read only, we basically got another couple of nines of reliability out of that. And it has to do with simpler crash recovery. You can bring up these tablets faster. All right, so um, there's been lots of questions throughout the presentation, but if there are any more, I'll be happy to attempt to answer them. Yes? Um, so you said earlier in the beginning of the presentation that uh, some workloads are CPU intensive, some workloads are storage intensive, and you obviously, uh, how do you solve the problem of co-locating them, co them and selling this as a service to the users? Do you let them pick and you let them say, I get that much CPU and that much compute, or do you kind of, behind the cover, try to gain the system somehow that you're trying to put the CPU intensive and the storage intensive in the same cluster so that you can serve them with the same hardware? So, if I can attempt to summarize the question, it's like, how are we, how are we, uh, how are we getting the data close to the compute such that it's efficient and how is that exposed to the user and what sort of controls do they have on that? So I'm gonna try and answer that question in terms of the entire cloud platform for a moment, which is fairly ambitious, but I'm gonna attempt that. We have certain services which are kind of continental in scale. Google Cloud Storage. This is a product I actually worked on, so I know it reasonably well. Um, that's a product where um, you don't get to choose you get to choose, is my data in North America or is it in Europe or is it in Asia? You're sort of choosing a continental level granularity. You can also choose a regional level of granularity. So now you're saying US West versus US East or US Central or something like that. Then there are certain products like uh, Google Compute Engine where you're getting a virtual machine, like it's in a particular place. And so that goes down to what we call a zone. So it's a hierarchy, basically a continent, a region, and a zone. Table is either a region or a zone level um, service, and I'm not sure which one it is, so I apologize for that. But it's either a region or a zone. Within a region, you get very, very low latency. So basically, when you're within a region, um, you can expect very low latency between your VMs and between those VMs and any regional level storage service. Um, Big Table would be one of those. So that's kind of, I'm not sure that really answers your question. Like it's not, a lot of people are really, are, are, are really, really want to know, like, are you putting my bytes on the exact same machine as the computation? And that's not necessarily a relevant question anymore in an age with clusters that have extremely high bandwidth between all of their nodes. The, the, the question is, um, two questions. What technology are you using between your nodes? And what kind of throughput are you getting between your nodes? And unfortunately, the answer to both of those questions is I'm not at liberty to say. Um, what I encourage you to do is spin up VMs in our cloud and run our perfkit benchmarker between them and see what you get. Right? Because regardless of what we're doing internally, that's what's available to you. Right? Yeah? So Google Cloud had a database that they called like data store. Is that also built on Bigtable? It is also built on Bigtable, but it has layers on top of Bigtable that uh, provide for extremely high availability and layer on sort of a SQLish uh, query language and provide multi-row level transactions. So it layers additional stuff on top of the raw big table. This is the raw big table that, that you're getting. Um, so, did that answer your question? Yeah? So, you mentioned there's three generations of big tables. Are these uh, like incremental operations like you mentioned here, or are these major rewrites like from GFS to Colossus? The question is uh, the three generations of big table, are they major rewrites or are they incremental? My impression is it's been like incremental improvements the whole time. But I'm not 100% sure of that answer. Like, they, we didn't create a new thing with a new name, like we did with GFS and Colossus. So. Second question. Uh, for the automation you mentioned, uh, to leverage this 
hot hybrid and what's a cold hybrid. Uh, and you leverage the coldness to help you uh, to save your recovery time. Uh, but in many scenarios, uh, as we're trying to distribute the data, we kind of share the data, cache them, and then distribute the rights to all the uh, hybrids. Uh, in which case, the opposite done wouldn't really help. So I think if I can summarize the question, if you organize your database such that your rights are spread evenly across all of your shards, yeah. the optimization I showed is useless. I think that's a true statement. Um, the fact that it wasn't useless, I guess, indicates that in practice, we're not finding that our rights are distributed really evenly across. So, um, yeah, one more, and then, oh, sorry. I'm actually going to try to grab two. I mean, so one question is, Google internally, most products don't go directly against Bigtable. They use another abstraction like on top of it. So I'm wondering, is it, what was the strategic decision to say when open source sort of Bigtable, not Megascore, some of the others that have much higher usability and are easier to use on core development? Is that coming later? Are you guys not ready to open, to open that up, or is there a strategic decision not to so, so the question is, um, if I can summarize, at Google, we often layer other technologies on top of Bigtable, uh, such as Megastore. So why aren't we shipping Google Cloud Megastore instead of Google Cloud Bigtable? Um, the, the answer to that is, if you look at the properties of something like the data store we already have, you'll find that we already shipped one of those products, right? We've shipped the thing that lives on top of Bigtable that adds a bunch of functionality to it. Um, internally at Google, we have products which use Bigtable raw because the characteristics of Bigtable are perfect for that application, and we have products that use things like Megastore. And it's not one size fits all, and we don't think it's gonna be one size fits all for our customers either. We think there are applications for both of these technologies, and we want to give them both access to both of them. So I'm sorry, because I'm way over time, and there's just one more thing I wanted to cover, which is this is the slide you want to take a photo of, because I want you all to try uh, Google Cloud Bigtable. And this gets you $500 of credit to play on the cloud platform. So you go to cloud.google.com, start a credit, and enter the code on the screen, and you can apply this $500 of credit to an existing project. I'm told this will stack on top of the $300 of starter thing. So if you've never used our platform, you get $300 to play with it. You can stack this on top of one of those projects or on top of an existing project. Um, and then, For those yes? of you without a camera, Clive is uploading it to the meetup group right now. So then the last thing, if you if you use our products and like them, that's great. I love that. If you use our products and you find things that you don't like about them, we want to hear from you too. And um, my colleague Sydney is over here. Stand up, Sydney. Um, she is a user researcher recruiter, which basically means she wants all of you to come in and run and, and go to our use go through our usability labs and help us make our products better by telling us what stinks about them. So she's got a bunch of cards um, that she'd love to hand out to some of you. So go find her in the break, and we'd love to see you and get your feedback on our products. Thank you very much.